Amen. We'll pick up tonight where we left off and, um, and, and try to get through some of this. But what, I'm, what we're doing here tonight, to me, is real, real important for every Christian to know. And it's a good Bible study. It'll help you to understand why some things are like they are. 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse number 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, and here's what we got, having loved, and he loved something. What is it? This present world. Now, there's some truth you just will get down in your heart. This, the old song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And every Christian needs to get there. Uh, a lady walked up to me this morning in church and said, Reggie, I remember when you turned 40. And I'm 55 now. And I can remember that. We had a little gathering down here in the church basement. Fifteen years has went by and I don't even have a clue where it went to. It's, the Bible said your life's like a vapor. It appears for a little time and vanishes away. And this, I want you to go to John chapter 17 tonight. Now, he loved this present world. Keep that in mind. Demas loved this present world. That very phrase tells you something. There's a world that's not this present world. There's a world beyond this world. There's a place beyond this place. Heaven. Eternity. And God wants us to set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. And that's a fact of life for the child of God. God wants us to get real about that because if we understand this world system as opposed to the eternal home for the saved, and one is temporal and one is wicked, one is temporary, uh, the other is eternal, the other is glory, the other is with God. And, uh, but anyway, Jesus' is great intercessory prayer in John chapter 17, we're going to read it. And uh, this, let's pick up verse number 1. These words spake Jesus, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. <clears throat> glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to, the, to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self, with the glory which I had with Thee before the world was. There was a time when this world as we know it was not. Now, this is the pre- this is If you had a red letter edition Bible, all the letters in this was read. This is a prayer Jesus prayed to God. This is one of the most important chapters in the Bible to understand the working of God with this world. Okay, now, verse number 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me, what? Out of the world. You and I are in this world, but God sent Jesus Christ to save you and I out of this world system. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Verse 17, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now watch this. I pray for them. Isn't that good to know that Jesus Christ prayed for us and is still interceding for us? I pray not for the world. Hmm. Hmm. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross here, folks. That's why he said the hour has come. He's getting ready to die for our sins. He's finished the work that God gave him to do. He's getting ready to go to the cross. And he said, verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. You and I are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. And by the way, that's the title Jesus gave to God the Father. That's why I don't like hearing the Pope called Holy Father, because he's not the Holy Father. God the Father in heaven is the Holy Father. Holy Father, keep, this ought to encourage you, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. How many thinks that God the Father will answer the prayer of God the Son? Jesus Christ asked the Holy Father to keep us. He said, keep through thine own name. He said, guard your own name. Through your own name, those that thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. 
Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition. Who knows who that is? That's Judas. That the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hateth them. You better get that one. You live for Christ, you be a Christian, the world hates you. It's a fact. Let me tell you something, folks. The world's not all composed of Liberty Faith Church. Folk. And the world hath hated them because they are... Look at verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hateth them. And here's why. Because they are not of the world. You and I, as Christians, he took us out of the world. We're no longer of the world, even as I am not of the world. Don't be shocked that the world doesn't love Jesus Christ. He's not of this world system. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. We pray sometimes that God would take us out of this world, but Jesus is not praying that. What's he praying? But that thou shouldest keep them from evil. We're in this world, but not of this world. The world hates us. But he says, uh, I want God, I'm asking you to keep them from evil. Verse number 16, they are not of the world, Christians, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, in other words, separate them, through thy truth. And we ought to underline this in your Bible, thy word is truth. In my study, I have a little plaque there that somebody gave me years ago. It has a picture of an open Bible, and it says, thy word is truth. And I always try to keep that in my form, thy word is truth. If I didn't believe that, I'd quit preaching tonight. Thy word is truth. You ought to underline it in the Bible. Verse number 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, watch this. Even so have I also sent them into the world. We've been sent into the world. We're not to go to a monastery and hole up for 42 years till Jesus comes. We're to go out of this church house tonight into the world this week with the gospel of Jesus Christ and with Christ living in us. In all the manifestations of our business dealings, our relationships with people, the way, whatever we do, we're to take Christ into this world. God has sent us into it. Verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. See, the Word of God is what will sanctify you. The Word of God is what will make you different. The Word of God is what's going to set you apart. The Word of God is what's going to make you different. The Word of God, the truth of it, is what's going to distinct, make you distinctive as a Christian as opposed to the world. Verse number 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but... Now, you ought to really grab this one. For them also which shall believe on me through their word. When Jesus spoke that, He said, I'm not just praying for those that, I'm, that I've walked with here on this earth. I'm praying for those that's going to believe on me in the future. Who's that? Uh, say, amen, that blessing, that is a blessing that Jesus prayed for us. Verse number 21, that they all may be what? Mm, that's a big one, isn't it? As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the, mm, and if I was asked you a question, what would make the world believe on Jesus Christ? The answer is right there. Do you know why the church is being trampled underfoot in America? Because we're not one. You look at, look at that verse. That verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. He says we don't, there's oneness in Christ. The Bible said in James that where there's division and strife and all that stuff, it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. And do you know what... Look what it says, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. He said, if my, my, my people will be one in Christ, the world's going to believe on Jesus. And when the world sees dissension among Christians, they won't believe. That oneness runs. What, what happens when you get married? The two shall be one. There's a oneness in Christ. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. And I want to tell you something. There ought not be no any organization in the world that ought to have more oneness in it than the church of Jesus Christ. And that's why the devil fights Christians to have a oneness of spirit and a oneness of unity in Christ together. Because the devil knows that if people see that, they're going to believe on Jesus Christ. Verse 22, In the glory which thou hast given me, which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. 
I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me. There again, not only will they believe on him, the world will know that God sent Jesus Christ if the church is one with Christ and one with each other. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Mm, I like that. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. But I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. And I in them. Now go to First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. We're talking about the subject of the world. And I, I, I wouldn't know how, any way to exaggerate or to stress tonight the importance of knowing the doctrine of the world in the Bible. The doctrine of the world. Accurately. And we're going to take just a little time tonight to really look it over. First John chapter 2, verse number 15. Does everybody there say amen? First John 2, 15. Now, this is a direct commandment. <clears throat> this is a direct command. Now, it's also interesting that the same John who wrote the book of John is writing this right here. So, there's a connection by the Holy Spirit's work in this right now. This is what he said, love not the world. Can anybody tell me what Demas' problem was? Having loved this present world. You need to ask yourself a question tonight. Do I love this present world? I didn't say that you didn't enjoy life. I don't think God's against you having, uh, having joy of the Lord, enjoying your home, your family, your work, your home, and so forth like that. I didn't say that. God says, love not the world. And Demas' problem that he forsook the work of the Lord and the people of the Lord was that he loved this present world, which is in direct contradiction to the Word of God. All right, he said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. I what that is. Things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what does that tell you about Demas? The love of the Father wasn't in him. See, remember this morning I told you that pressure and persecution will reveal who you are or who you're not. And that's why God allows persecution and pressures and problems to come into your life that has the pressure of getting you away from God and from God's people and God's work. And all that did, all that persecution pressure did was just reveal to Demas what was in his heart. You see, we can put on a big show. But when the pressure comes, that's when we find out. And it's the same way in our marriages. Same way in a lot of relationships. It reveals whether there's any love of God there. The cords of love that holds us to the altar. He said... Uh, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, here's what's in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Now, let me give you an illustration of lust. And don't take this wrong, but it's just this is the way it works. I go up to Farm Fest next weekend and I see this four-wheeler. And I want that four-wheeler. Now, there's nothing wrong with four-wheelers. But if that four-wheeler becomes an object of my affection to the point of that I will forsake the Lord in areas of business or whatever to, to get for the goal of getting that, what happens is God eventually reveals that my love is for things of the world because I'm willing to forsake God's truth to get it. Or I'm willing to forsake time with the Lord or whatever it may be. Is that making any sense at all? See, it's not the direct object. It's the motivations behind getting the object and the things of the world. What will we sacrifice in our spiritual life to get the things of the world? I had a lady called today, Hannah said, and she just uh, wanted, uh, she had called yesterday evening about looking at a place. And then she called this morning after I left home, I come to church, she called wanting me to take and show her Folks, this place this afternoon. And I told him, I'm not taking her. People don't understand. They can't comprehend that somebody might give God a day and they're not going to go out and show property. And um, they just don't understand that. 
You know, to me, I'd be selling out the Lord. And I'm not, I know the ox gets in the ditch, and I've done things on Sunday. I've, I've done some things, you know, on rare occasions. But, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about a pattern here. You know, just saying, well, boy, if I can make, make some big money right here, man, they're up here. Because the idea was, they're here now. They've got to look at it today. If they don't look at it today, boy, they're, you know. And you think, ching, 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 that money sign starts going, well, boy, I better go do this. I might miss the big bucks. And those are just, I'm just trying to illustrate to you some things. Maybe it's different for you. I don't know. But uh, he said the lust, lust, first of all, the lust of the flesh. That's just pure old, that old flesh lust. And then you can go from Genesis on through. That's took more people to hell than anything. Lust of the flesh. The, the, the world uses the lust of the flesh to sell everything. I mean, how in the world could you get a, diet, get, get a guy to drink a bunch of liquor, get him drunk or in a skunk and puking his guts out and hung over the next morning and, and ruining his life if you didn't show him some good-looking women all, you know. I mean, that, they, they got to lie to you to get you to do the stupid stuff. It's the lust of the flesh. They use the flesh to sell everything. Literally, literally right now, pornography is used in every issue of American life right now because the lust of the flesh is so prevalent and so captivating, so empowering. Lust of the eyes, then there's the pride of life. I mean, we want to be able to, people to think we're something. Pride of life is a very, very serious thing. I have to fight it. Now, remember Demas' name. What was Demas' name? Popular. Pride of life. He said, those, by the way, those are the three things. If you go back to Genesis, those are the three things that Eve was tempted with. There are the three things Christ was tempted with in Matthew chapter 4. Same three, all the way through. It's consistency through the Scripture. Every sin you'll ever deal with is traced back to these three. And we won't do that tonight, but anyway. Now, he said, these are not of the Father, but is of the world. Those three things is of the world. Verse 17, now here's the reason. Why doesn't God want you to get involved in that junk? The world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. God's holy. God's not sinful. That's why. Okay, uh, let's go to James. One last passage of Scripture here, and then we're going to hit the, hit the screen and roll. James chapter 1, verse number uh, 27. James 1, verse 27. <coughs> Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this. Attend church three times a week. Pure religion and undefiled before the... Before God and the Father is this. Preach all over the country. What is it? What's pure religion undefiled before God? Father. Visit the fatherless. And the widows. Now, it didn't say pure salvation. Make a distinction there. It said pure religion. Religion is to be the outward manifestation of the inward salvation. Faith without works is dead. Visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Number one. Number two, keep himself unspotted from what? The world. Serious business, isn't it? God says... You want pure religion in your life? You want the pure manifestation of the inward salvation that God gives? He said, visit the fatherless and the widows, the poor, the, the people that have a hard time helping themselves. He said, do that. And then he said, he said, you help those people. Then he said, you keep yourself unspotted from the world. Now, how would you keep yourself unspotted from the world? Anybody got any thoughts about that tonight? I ought to be interested in it because it says this is pure religion, undefiled before God the Father. Huh? Stay away from evil. Read the book. Read the book. That's right. Thy word. Now you cling to the word which I have spoken unto you. And practice what we learn. Practice what we learn. If you keep yourself unspotted from evil, what, what, what are some things that you should or should not be involved with and do? Keep yourself unspotted from the world. We're in the world. Leave when the liquor flows, like he's talking to Lindell there. Unspotted. Just think about that for a while. Let's go. Here we go. The world, by definition, in this lesson, we don't mean the earth. Okay? We don't mean the globe. 
We mean mankind as a whole. And by the way, it's interesting. I don't have it with me right now, but the word world has a connection with the, the word man in, your, in, a, in a language study. It's man's time. The world has it, the basic definition of the world. There's a, there's a connection. It means man's sphere when man is. All right. But mankind's a whole in the great world system into which it's organized. That's a lot of what Linda was dealing with up there is this world system. And who's behind this world system? Satan. Satan. The world and Satan. Now let's read this. It has Satan as its ruler. Now, this is Bible. I've got a verse for everything here. This is Bible. There's no argument about this tonight. There's no debate about this. Understand what you're dealing with. Understand as a Christian that the world is not your friend. You're in the world, but not of it, and you better know your enemy. And if you'll understand this, it'll help you in your Christian walk. It has Satan as its ruler. John 14, 30. Hereafter I will not talk with you, for the prince of this world cometh. The prince of this world Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4. You know what Satan said to him? If you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Did you know Satan knew that Jesus Christ had a prophetic claim to all the kingdoms of the world and he was trying to get Jesus to fulfill the will of God, but in a perverted way? That's a message in itself. He's the prince of this world. Let me tell you something. This world, he's not my prince. He's not your prince if you're saved, but he's the prince of this world. And he rules this world system. And you wonder, why are they doing these stupid things up for you? What's wrong with people? They've got a prince called the devil. And he's ruling them. All right? And hath nothing in me. Amen? Jesus said, that old devil has nothing in me. Uh, John 16, 11, Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Amen? I got, all I've got to do is read Revelation chapter 20, verses 10. And I see he's cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. He's already judged. The sentencing day just hadn't come yet. Number two, it has Satan as its God. Second Corinthians one twenty one, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, to the image of God, should shine on them. I'm not sure that reference is right. I think that's typed in wrong. But maybe is that Second Corinthians four? Somebody want to check that. But anyway, make sure your, your reference on that's right. Look at this. And look, G, little God of this world. This world has a God. The world's God is Satan. You've got to get a hold of that. You won't be threatened so much. That's why the Bible says, threaten not thyself because of evildoers. Don't get shook up about it. This world has its God. We have our God. Number three, it's controlled by Satan. Now, listen, when, when, we, when we say this, we're not saying he has ultimate control, ultimate rulership, but he has, he has jurisdictional power because when Adam forfeited his jurisdictional leadership in Genesis... Satan took it over, and God is allowing him at this period of time in history, this rulership of this prince. It's controlled by Satan. First John five nineteen. We know that we are God, and the whole what? World lieth in wickedness. So tonight, God hadn't God told us it's a wicked world. The whole world lieth in wickedness. That's when you drive out you know, why don't you see billboards everywhere? Jesus loves you. You know, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten. Why do you see liquor and pornography and everything everywhere? Why isn't TV full of uh, amazing grace? When, why don't they start their advertisements with, Oh, how I love Jesus? Because the whole world lies in wickedness. Get it down. That's what the Bible said. Yes. It's, okay, that should be 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 right there. If you want to correct that, if you take, take a note. All right, here we go. The world and God. Now, we look, first of all, at the world and Satan. Here's what The world does not know God. The world does not know God. Now, remember, we read John 17. It tells you how God's operating. God has given Jesus Christ those that He gave Him. And Jesus said, Thou hast given me, I have kept. You can just believe this or not, but you were given by the Father to Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. That'll rock your boat. The world does not know God. 1 Corinthians one twenty one. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom. All wisdom is not good. There is a worldly wisdom. You can have PhDs and be an engineer and be a scientist and don't know God. There's a worldly wisdom. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, what? Knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. See, the world thinks the guys like mere idiots. They get different preaching. 
make a fool out of yourself preaching. They wouldn't dare. And if they do get into it, they want to be very dignified and very, you know, very suave and very neat. And, you know, so the world likes the world. They impress the world. John 17, 25. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. The world does not believe God. Romans eleven thirty. For as, ye, as, for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. The world hates God. Romans 1.30. Don't ever forget this. Backbiters. Haters of God. Can I tell you that's what? It's not that they, they don't hate a God, but they just hate the God of the Bible. Paul said there'd come a time when they worship another Christ, another Jesus, another spirit. <clears throat> and this is why it really, really ticked me off when George Bush equated the Christian God to Allah. That was an absolutely horrific, abominable statement. Because that's just what the world wants. They want to equate, carve out a Jesus that's just this same God that they're worshiping. It's not so, by any stretch of imagination. It opposes God. 1 John 2.16 For all that is in the world... Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. James 4.4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is what? Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. The church is called out of the world. The church is a body of believers called out of the world. And by the way, He's literally going to take us out of this world. We are not, we're in this world, but not of this world. And by the way, this kind of preaching needs to be done so folks can really decide, you know, do I want to be of the world or I want to be of the church? Am I in the world or am I in the church? But you can't have a leg in either one of them for very long. Okay. The world and the Lord Jesus Christ. It did not know Christ. First John 1 John 1.10, He was in the world. And the world was made by Him. And the world knew Him not. They still don't. It did not believe Christ. John 8.45, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. They still don't believe Christ. It hated Christ. Isn't it amazing that in the public forum and on news media, it's alright to talk about Allah. It's alright to talk about Buddha. It's alright to talk about God in general. But do not mention the name Jesus Christ. Now, I hit George Bush a little bit ago. Let me say something good about it. He, he was interviewed running for president. They asked him who his hero was. He said, Jesus Christ is my hero. And they land blasted him. You don't mention Jesus Christ on the national news media. It's forbidden. And that's the attitude of the world. It hates. Uh, it hated Christ. John 7, 7. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth because I test of that, that the works thereof are evil. This is why preachers have a hard time preaching on evil. Because what will happen if you preach on the evil of the world? Hatred comes at you. Nobody likes to be hated. The world rejected Christ. You stand up for, you stand against evil on your workplace and see how many people like you for it. It rejected Christ, Isaiah 53, for he should grow up before him as a tender plant and root out of dry ground. He hath no form of comeliness, and when we shall see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. Jesus Christ would not have made a Hollywood star. The Bible is very clear right there. He was not necessarily a good-looking person. He wasn't something that drew people and was attracted people by His looks. The world's attracted by looks. Can I tell you how stupid churches are? They want a young, good-looking preacher who can really talk good. Who can mix in the community good. Hmm. Can I tell you a little story? I went and held a revival meeting for a church. And I drove up in that church parking lot. And this is the truth. The preacher was one of the largest men I've ever seen in my life. And I'm not advocating not taking care of your body. But he was huge. Okay? He was huge. I mean, I literally was kind of like, good man, wow, that guy is big. I got out of the car. I shook his hand. He said, I'm Pastor so-and-so. We went in the church and I preached that night. I preached a revival that week. And I didn't know what was going on. You know, you can be, you don't know what's going on. 
But it wasn't very long after that, the church, there began a group in the church. And this, actually, I, I know what happened now. God used that revival just to, to really blow that thing wide open to get that thing going. And by the way, there's been a lot of people saved since this situation. But I won't go to that. But I got word later. They called me and said, pray for us. And do you know what one of the things that the people were saying they wanted to rid the preacher for? He's too fat. People don't like fat preacher. That was their criteria for getting rid of the preacher. Isn't that sick? Let me tell you something. That old boy could pray. I can tell you that one thing. He could pray. I was with him about four days. I want to tell you one thing. That old boy loved God. Had one of the sweetest spirits of anybody you've ever been around in your life. But because it was, I want to tell you something. It wasn't his fatness. They just picked. They just looking for things to, to get people down on him about. And they finally voted him out. We hear that we our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The world crucified Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. The princes of this world knew. That, what does it tell you? Which none of the princes of this world knew. They did not know Jesus Christ. What's that tell you about leadership, by and large? <coughs> There'll be very few leaders that know Jesus Christ. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, I'm going to get this. Watch this real careful. For had they, the princes of this world, knew, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. When somebody tries to tell you that the Jews crucified Jesus Christ, and I know about the verse in the Bible, but when they use that verse, you tell them, you take them to this verse, the world crucified Jesus Christ. And the princes of this world, <clears throat> by the way, and the princes of this world, were under, that was under Gentile dominion. Huh. I take care of the Israel haters. I get off on tangents, don't I? The world and the Holy Spirit does not know the Spirit. James fourteen seven, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. That's one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. I'll tell you, if you've got the Spirit of truth in you and you walk into a church house, you better pay attention to the Spirit of truth in you. You may not be able to identify something's wrong, but your Spirit's saying something's wrong in this place. You may be around somebody, and you know what? They may be talking good and looking good, but your spirit's saying, something's wrong here. You better be paying attention to the spirit of truth. Amen. It opposes the spirit. Acts seven fifty one. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. <coughs> the world is convicted by the spirit. John 16, verse 7 through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go away, I send him to you. And when he has come, he will do something. Reprove the world of sin. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. That's why they don't want the Holy Spirit of God. They want another spirit, but they don't want the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit of God will say, that's wrong, that's wrong. God will not do that. <clears throat> Let me just tell you a little something. I'm going to just say something flat-footed here tonight. You know, I got pretty rough here a few weeks ago and talked about being a coward and smoking. And I, and, and I preached some pretty rough stuff. And I'll tell you what. I'm going to say this to you tonight. And I'm not ashamed of that. And I don't apologize for preaching that. Amen. And I don't apologize for preaching about how people hook and crook everybody else in business. And I got hit with that too. I'm going to preach on that stuff. You want to let you, and if you want to hear more of it, you just castigate me and jump on me for doing it. I'll, 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 I'll preach some more on it. I'm going to tell you something. It, listen, understand it. I don't hate anybody. I'm not mad at nobody in the world. But it is my job before Almighty God. It's my calling. I'm not preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit if I'm not reproving the world of sin. I'm not, I'm not preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit if I'm not preaching the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I am not preaching the Word of God if I'm not preaching. I'm not preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit if I'm not preaching on judgment. Have you noticed that the last few weeks I've preached on judgment and righteousness and I've preached on reproving on sin? And just as sure as you do that, and I, I, I really do understand why preachers kind of just, man, lie, I'm going to leave it alone. I don't want to put up with the flack. <clears throat> Watch this, though. Of sin because they believe in all of them. That's the, biggest, that's the sin that will send you to hell. Not believing on Jesus Christ. 
of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Amen. The world and the Christian. Here you are. And here's what I wanted to get to. It does not know us. 1 John 1, 3. Behold what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew Him not. How far do you think you'd get in political office if you got up every speech and said, before I start this speech, I just want to say one thing. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He suffered and died on the cross for my sins. He's God Almighty and ain't no way but to heaven but through Jesus Christ. Now I want to, now I want to speak to you folks today. I'd like to ask you to vote for me. <laughs> you find out that 70% of professed church going people say, oh, he ought not talk about Jesus Christ when he gets up there. Oh, not. You know, I talk, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm more of a child. I'm the like worst coward than you think I am. I don't just, a lot of times I don't do what I ought to. But I talk about put that verse on my, my cards, you know, for auctions. There's people who don't like that. Hell, he mixes religion with his business. Uses the Bible. Oh, really? You know, I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm a half coward. I don't do near what I ought to do. <laughs> and they think I do too much. The world doesn't know us. It hates us. John 15, 18. Get this down. Get it down. This is God's Word. Get it down. The world hates you. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you. <laughs> but because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. But we want to be Demas popular. Uh Uh-oh. But we want to be liked. John 17, 40. I have given them thy word, and and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The world hath hated them. The world does not receive our testimony. John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Who hath believed our report and to whom is our Lord revealed? The world's guilt. Of course, the world is evil. The world's guilt. Of course, the world's evil. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you have to be quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. God says, before you got saved, you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, you did what the devil told you to do. The Spirit. See, there's more than one kind of Spirit. Notice that's not Holy Spirit. The Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What kind of Spirit is it that gets people to do things that's wrong? Among whom also we had our conversation times past, lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Every man is sin, for there is not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Psalms 14, 2 and 3, The Lord looked down heaven among the children of men to see if there are any that did understand and seek God. They're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. That's why I believe in the total depravity of man. God says it, and it's real. The world stands guilty before God. Romans three nineteen. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world Become, may become guilty before God. That's what God says about the world. The world's Savior. The Father sends the Savior of the world. First John 4, 14, we have seen him do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You know, after all we've read about the world, you wouldn't think God loved the world, would you? But he does. Christ came to save the world. John 12, 14, if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to what? Save. save. He died for the sins of the world. John 2, 2, 1 John 2, 2. He is the perpetuation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The blood of Jesus Christ could save everybody that's ever been born. There's not 14,262,000 people can be saved now after that and not enough. That blood was shed for the entire world. <clears throat> he took away the sins of the world. John 1, and this is what's so stupid. The, the blood's been shed. The sin's been paid. The sin of the world. But you have to re- personally perpetuate it. Isn't that a waste? Do you think about a waste? You know, there's a science. I see it. It's a, uh, 
what a, a, a child's mind is a ter- horrible thing to waste. The salvation that Jesus Christ has given us is a horrible thing to waste. He took away the sin of the world. The next day, John said, Jesus is coming to him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. <clears throat> lastly tonight, we'll pick it up Wednesday night. This is the last one, the world's destiny. Now, folks, there's two trains running out of this station. There's a train called the world, and there's a train called the church. You better be on the right train. And you've got to get a ticket to get on the right train. It don't cost you anything, but you've got to get it. And that ticket is Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The world is deceived and doomed. <clears throat> I'm like Lindell, and that's why I was so appreciative of what he said. I wish they cared enough for the moral deterioration, the spiritual deterioration of this country as they do for the kangaroo rat and the horned hoot owl. By the way, I want to tell you something. I'm going to join this movement. There's a movement now starting in California to do away with all four-lane highways and, and all highways. I'm telling you something. There are rats being killed on our highways. There are squirrels being killed on our highways. There are people who are running over turtles with no thought. You can no longer grow garden vegetables in a highway. I tell you, I'm for doing away with highways. That's just how bright all that stuff is. You know, I think if you're so for protecting these animals, let's get rid of the four-lane highways and all the two lanes and the roads because that's where a lot of them gets killed. And it's interesting that they're not interested in it, much less the fact that people get killed on highways. I mean, I could start a crusade down with the highways, out with the highways. <laughs> Poor little squirrel gets out. A, a, a tree drops a nut in the middle of the road. Poor little squirrel goes out there. Back and forth, he doesn't know where to go. You run over him, kill that squirrel right in the middle of the highway. If we didn't have highways, there'd be a lot more squirrels in our country left. Well, that is true. I never thought about that. The buzzards wouldn't have anything deep. But anyway, <clears throat> see how ludicrous this stuff is? They don't really care about it. They get, they get taxpayer money to drive up a deal. They're all getting paid for this junk. The world's deceived. World's doomed. Revelation 27, 9. And the thousand years expired, Satan shall be released out of his prison and go out to see the nations of the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog together and together the battle. Number of whom is the sand of the sea. Went upon the breath of the earth. Came past the camp of the sun. Out, and the blood of the city fire came down and got out of heaven and devoured them. They're deceived. They're doomed. The world shall be judged. Acts 17, 30. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. That's Jesus Christ. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. The world shall pass away. Verse John 2, 7. The world passeth away. And the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's the world. Now, next Wednesday night, Lord willing, or Sunday morning or something, who knows when, we're going to talk about the Christian's relationship to the world. And this is powerful. It's important. So it tells you, first of all, we're looking at what the world is. It's a big issue, isn't it? Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Let's stand together tonight. Father, we come for you tonight. I tell you the truth about it is, I don't understand a lot of things, Lord. And I look at the whole picture of things, and Lord, it's beyond my ability, Lord, to comprehend everything, Lord. But I read in the Bible, Lord, about this thing called the world. And I know, Lord, it's true, because, Lord, I've experienced it. I see it, Lord. It's the way the world dresses the way the, Lord, the world fixes their hair even, Lord. The way the world combs their hair. The clothing the world wears. The way the world talks. The things that the world does. Lord, it's all diametrically dep- opposed to what you, Lord, have ordained for the church and your people. And God, I tell you that tonight I pray that as an individual that I would, uh, Lord, be, uh, Lord, on the right side of this whole issue. And God, that I'd not love the world. Know the things of the world. Lord, I tell you, I appreciate the sunshine, and I appreciate the cool breeze, and I appreciate the walnuts on the tree, and I, Lord, I appreciate all this, this old earth, and I appreciate, Lord, the place you give us to live. But God, help us not to fall in love with that which is going to pass away. Help us to set our affections on things above. 
I pray, God, that you'll give us a love for you and not this world. Help us, Lord, to uh, Lord, be equipped as Christians in this world know how to operate. Uh, be as the men of Issachar that understood the times, know what we should do. And Father, we've got a lot of this deception of this world that's running this country. We pray to God tonight against it. We pray, Lord, for the power of the Holy Ghost to come against the powers of evil. We pray for the defeat of this legislation. I pray, God, that the Holy Ghost will turn them. They won't even understand, but they'll be turned against it and fail the votes. And, Lord, rise up people to stand against it and move by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray, to stop this stuff, Lord. And, Lord, we just thank you tonight for the power of God. Lord, you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Lord, according to the power that worketh in us, bless these families, bless these homes, these individuals. God, I pray that each of us will walk with the Lord. As we go out of this building, God, and have a personal close walk with Jesus Christ, God, give us grace to live right this week and to think right and talk right and to do right. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.